College, Pune. Then he has done his uh, DM in Child and Adolescent Psychiatry from National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Bangalore. Uh, currently, he is a classified specialist in psychiatry, base hospital, New Delhi. He was formerly a graded specialist in psychiatry in uh, base hospital in Guwahati and uh, Jodhpur. He is a classified specialist in Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Command Hospital in Lucknow. Uh, Sarah has been awarded Marfatia Award for Epidemiological Study of Dementia under Ages of Mental Health Program, Maharashtra, Pune Chapter in ANSEPS 2009. Uh, Sarah has also presented a paper in multiple conferences, national and international levels. In the ICAM Con 2015, uh, he has presented a paper on prospective study of parenting and callous un uh, unemotional trait and outcome, the outcome of operational deficient disorder. And he has also presented in 2014 in the same Ipsacon conference uh, on psychiatric comorbidity in children with developmental disorders, behavioral equivalent of mood disorder as case report. And in answer 2013, Sarah has presented as elective mutism in child, children and adolescent experiences from a tertiary care center. As you see, uh, most of his uh, research work and publications are uh, in the field of uh, childhood and adolescent psychiatry, uh, even before he joined uh, DM. And uh, he has four publications peer reviewed in national and international journals and participated in various national and international uh, workshops and uh, uh, CMEs. Uh, SAR is also interested in skills, training, and development of curriculum for teachers, parents working and living with children with special needs and developmental disorders and ADHD, including development of parent support group. So, with this introduction, I would like to uh, call upon uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Raghu, to take over the session. Welcome, sir. I would like to thank uh, the organizers of Chitnad Medical College for giving me this wonderful opportunity to interact on this uh, afternoon with all of you. And it was a very pleasant uh, surprise for me when I got a call from Dr. Kailash. And of course, I knew that, the, that there was a driving force behind it, Dr. Shabiba, and of course, there would be a whole team behind it, which is of course Dr. Shabari and everybody. So thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, this opportunity. And it has been a really uh, eye-opener and really welcome in this day of COVID when everything has become so compartmentalized. And this pro is probably is a very path-breaking kind of uh, interaction out here. So with that, uh, I would uh, like to start my uh, presentation. And uh, I am talking on the management of disruptive behavior disorders over the next couple of minutes. Well, uh, to start with, the topic is quite close to my heart because um, this is something that I had given a lot of thought to in my initial formative years at Nimhans, where Dr. John Vijay Sagar was uh, my guide and my teacher who was getting me understand the nuances of uh, oppositional defiance disorders and other disruptive behavior disorders and how to manage them became a part of my thesis itself. So uh, the scope of the problem out here, and I would like to tell you, is something like a tip of the iceberg. So we are talking about emotion. And as Dr. Soumya's uh, lecture was in the very beginning, she had used the very famous quote by Dr. Girimaji um, at Nimhans that emotions are very difficult to manage. So that is a final end point. So when we go to emotion, we better go through probably initially the events and then we delineate the problem and then probably go towards the emotion and the emotion that we are talking about out here in disruptive behavior disorders is that of anger now uh, we do understand that anger is one of the basic uh, emotions which uh, like the other ones are uh, like um, happiness and sadness something like uh, disgust surprise uh, there we got anger and fear and such of these ones. The thing with anger being one of the primary emotions is that somehow, somewhere, it is hardwired into our brain, which means that there is some kind of program which the brain is running. And um, as we do understand that that's the triangle of our psyche is somewhere about the manifestation, that is the behavior that we see, that is in disruptive behavior disorders, uh, be it in the sense of uh, ODD where we have uh, something like anger, uh, irritability, we got defiance and we got a couple of vindictiveness or in much more serious things like in conduct disorder, we got more towards rule, vo rule violations. We got uh, uh, something like uh, aggression towards uh, animals, humans and uh, something like destruction and things. So that is an overt behavior. 
and behind the scenes so what's also happening is something that is the emotions that is that of anger and the third thing that is the you know mentations the cognitions behind it so uh, all of these three things is what we have to be touching and what we really do see is only you know certain defined behaviors which is of course the tip of the iceberg now uh, manipulating any emotion is a very herculean task to even go there we'll have to start uh, you know realizing that there is an emotion called as an anger uh, fortunately the nature has given us a very powerful tool to utilize to manage this particular a uh, destructive emotion and of course it is also has got its own survival value also uh, and that uh, tool that the nature has given us is uh, that of language now be it like the words that we use or we have got a symbolic you know a way of representing the facts whatever it is the symbolization helps us you know characterize define and thus from from just pure feeling and experiencing we can Uh, symbolically arrive to manipulating information and manipulating information helps us change perspectives it changes the way how we look at a particular problem and we are able to move from just pure feeling and feeling probably helpless uh, in a situation of anger to maybe move on towards behaviors and towards changing our behaviors and towards adaptation and such so uh, a little bit about uh, what is happening Um, uh, around us is that over the years we used to think a lot about uh, opposition, uh, the disruptive behaviors, the anger manifestation, defiance, and all such of them. They are probably the product of socializations. The studies were mostly focused upon what is happening in the milieu of these children or adolescents, and of course there was evidently and visible things like maltreatment, uh, deprivation. Uh, other things like uh, evident things like uh, substance use, and uh, there was patterns of probably uh, you know uh, anger uh, which was giving rise to more anger and things like that. And there always this uh, that there is always a sense of also getting away from the mainstream of society. So uh, this was understood initially as a product of you know uh, problematic socializations, interpersonal differences. Over the years, uh, the coming years, the recent. there is a lot of uh, interest and uh, over the biology behind it and now there is a increasing body of evidence which points towards the presence of strong uh, biological component which includes genetic and also uh, the brain differences which points out to that there is something which is uh, different about the way how these children they perceive the situation the way they once aroused how uh, do they uh give uh, how do they react to a particular situation how do they how are they able to calm themselves down and uh, things like that so it is just not a matter of a different socialization but also a lot of biology is there behind it which is pushing the person towards a particular set of behaviors uh secondly uh, studies have also shown some uh, particular uh, Uh, onset of the illness if it is late onset or is early onset has got a effect upon the way how the problem perceive or uh, persists and also the presence of certain traits like the callous and unemotional traits uh, where the children they have got a different way of perceiving and even uh, relate uh, empathetically with others and these have got an issue on how the child uh, the conduct problems persists or they the, or the severity with which uh, we we uh, see the initial clinical manifestations uh over the years uh, there is has been an operationalization of these uh, problems there has been effective programs to help and deal with them and uh, me myself was also a part of one of such an endeavor while i was at nans to make it simple and uh, to be able to be effective and to uh, let go to let on what i have learned to the parents who are the people who actually bring these children to us uh so as i move on i am going to be dealing with the management of disruptive behavior disorders and my talk is not going to be compartmentalized but it is going to be one flow so at uh, the problem uh, in the very beginning it's very important that we have a sense of what is happening at the adolescent or the child who is coming to us so i am going to be sharing with you certain nuances which i caught up one of them is that uh, the understanding of the sense of agency 
Now, the child, as we know, is in the midst of developing a sense of agency and it is very nascent and it is pressured or it is pushed by the biology. And of course, the child living inside a milieu by the people around them. And so they have got their levels of interactions with them. They have they have got their levels of understanding of their world view of dealing with the matter. And they tell these things to the child per se. So there are many parenting efforts and the parenting efforts is not only uh, uh, from uh, not, not only from uh, the side of the parents, but also from the side of well-meaning adults, the teachers, maybe even peers, you know, and such. And so in this multidirectional interaction, what ends up is something that we, uh, which I love to call as a kitchen. Now, the issue is that when the child comes to us, there is a problem. And the important part is that we are able to focus on the problem as a problem and not as a child being the problem. And this very cleverly helps us to externalize the problem and let the child be free from all of this conundrum or what's happening around them and be free to develop the agency and be free to understand a different way of coping and be not be a part of his self-esteem or understanding that I am the problem per se. This is a very first one of the very important parts that I learned and the person who gave this particular phrase to me was Dr. Shekhar Shishadri and I can never forget this or thought I will uh, uh, you know uh, share it with you. Now the second thing that is important for me are the three questions. Now that is the what, the why and the why now. Why is it important is because when the child and adolescent or the adolescent comes with us into the you know consultation chamber they are going to be so many uh, you know problems uh, blame so many systems happening at the same time that you are going to be lost if you do not have a, a format or a framework to understand and to focus on what is most important what can be changed and what cannot be at this particular point of time so from there comes the question of what so if we are able to sift the what has brought the child to you and we write it down somewhere, we are able to have a start point from where we can, we got an entry point towards the whole system which has uh, now brought the child uh, to you. The second part of it is why in this person helps me keep a focus on what are the risk factors and what are the productive factors, both of which can be addressed at each another, at some of the other point. And the th third thing that is very important for me is the question of why now? Now, why do I stop on this is because of the very important nature that every human being is going to have a subset of interaction with people around them. It is not natural, it is not deviancy to have a sense of, uh, you know, of defiance or independence or lying about things, about boundary violations. It is not. It is almost normative in most of the cases and it leads to adaptation. The importance of understanding the why now is what went wrong. If you know what went wrong, you will be able to address it. And that is the most important part. And also, also because what I have got this personal thing that if it isn't broken, don't fix it. So because you will not be able to address each and everything that the parent or the well-meaning adult is going to bring in front of you, especially with a child who is having disruptive behavior disturbances. Now, so the, this is the three things that I, that I have. Now, there is a special kind of children who come with delinquency and with the rule violations and harming others and property destructions. And there, we as psychiatrists also are human beings, as Dr. Swami had also pointed out. And as Dr. Shankar before me has told about all the legal aspects of what was happening out here, um, you know, and the juvenile in care, a need for care and protection. And when these children, they break the rules, they are at the receiving end of a lot of criticism. Now, the thing is that we as psychiatrists have got one role to play out here. That is, whatever be the consequence of the final end result of it, but we have got an obligation to help the child understand and maybe even help the child explore the various ways how the child can behave and towards a different outcome. Uh, now, I uh, start with understanding the problem that is a child. Now, keeping this is very important because uh, in the whole, we get a one for two deal. That is when the child comes, so does the parent comes. And it's important to understand both of them so that we can look at the problem. From a developmental perspective, is very important, that, that part. Now, 
uh, as a psychiatrist, when I am dealing with a child, I have got so much of information in my hand and I am ready to pass it on all of it to the child. Now, the thing is that the child is at a different level. So until unless you are not able to understand where the child is, what are his language capacities, what are his capacities to understand what you're speaking about, what are the cognitions the child has happening uh, like in his head, is he able to think rationally or not, does he have a different kind of a thinking of hypothesis, is he able to manipulate facts in his head, you will be probably having difficulties until unless you are able to understand those nuances which Soumya had spoken about in her first slides. It's very important to first of all join with the child, know what the child is and then depending upon the skill sets either work towards developing those skill sets of language or developing those skills of perspectives or developing the skills of emotional containment or whichever else it is like that now it's important that as we are interacting with the child that we have certain schemas in our mind because the problem is being the, the tip of the iceberg is of course the anger and the disruptive behaviors and the defiance but something else is happening at the background and that is the child is somewhere. There is a reason behind it. So the reason is going to also change depending upon what the child's goal is at, at that point of time. So I heavily borrow from Ericsson in this. You can borrow from any person whom you like developmentally and to know as to what is the life uh, stages where the child is right now uh, facing. And maybe it will give me some guidance about what I can fix on also normatively. So for a child who is on a toddler, there has to be uh, something like, uh, uh, you know, exploration of the surroundings in a safe manner without making the a child, be, uh, you know, being too restricted. If it is a school going child, then you'll have to uh, look at those parts. That is how good the child is able to negotiate the academic environment and what are the goals there? Uh, is, is a child having, uh, you know, uh, positive expectancies there or and, and positive experiences there and if it is an adolescence you have to look at the relationship that the adolescence is entering into and the safe practices that they are going to be faced with at many times and probably all of these questions are going to be helping you understand the problem which is of course uh, you know not just the problem and the second thing is that the child doesn't come alone there is always a dynamic happening in the house many times in my interview i asked the parent tell me you know, whom does the child or whom does his behavior remind you of? And Pat comes the answer. This is just the father, just as defined and just doesn't listen to me. And I understand that there is something more deeper, something more different about what is happening than just the behavior. So there are certain family systems also, which are, which are also there, which are functional, which you'll have to understand before you can do something about it. Now, uh, the as I've told that we move from the child to the milieu per se and there are certain uh, issues that are very evident to you. The child has got a lot of uh, you know, uh, people who are teaching the child well-meaning things uh, about how to behave in a particular manner, how to uh, be uh, with, with people and, uh, uh, and there are peer influencers, there are siblings uh, who are going to be there and the parent himself. These are the evident ones that you know that from where is modeling happening and that's important to bring to the table. The second thing that is not really, uh, really evident to us is a transgenerational cross of parenting style itself. So something like you can think of a perfectionist grandmother and the mother who was anxious in nature. And then there's a child who is having disruptive or emotional discontrol or disturbances. So you can imagine what is happening without watching uh, these transgenerational uh, transfers of parenting, etc. you will not be able to do much. There will be a lot of, uh, you know, uh, enmeshment there. There'll be a lot of uh, uh, problems which are not really entrenched problems. They're not going away. So until unless you are not looking at those points in the milieu, you will not be able to do justice. In each case, at least you, uh, there will be a lot of roadblocks there. Now, there's also something called as the experiences of childhood. And I do understand and I do heavily take on from Freud also when he says that the child is a father of the man. And, but not in that sense, but in the sense of the secure base and the secure haven effect. That is, as we understand that the child is exploring the environment because there is a safety network of the parent. And when the child goes and explores and comes back, the child expects that when he comes back, whatever he brings to the home back is also accepted. Now, why I bring it out here is that, that those experiences of childhood are also going to be operative when you as, an, as a psychiatrist are going to be working with the child, and especially because you are an, an adult and 
the past experiences of being ability to explore and to be uh, understood non judgmentally is going to play very very heavily upon uh, the dynamics that you uh, have uh, got with the child and it's very important to join with the child because if until the child doesn't know that you are able to understand uh, him or her probably he will not be able to you know uh, let you inside a glimpse of the growing mind and the problems that the child is facing so it is extremely important about these experiences to be somewhere in the back of your mind and to be able to understand that now as we are looking at the problem per se we'll have to operationalize it somehow we'll have to you know use certain questionnaires so that we are able to focus our problems per se now uh, these are various kinds of them and uh, i've just chosen a couple of them to just give you a glimpse of it for example if you are going to be giving questionnaires to the family uh, to the you know uh, the parents or to the teacher per se so they may not be very well versed with the questionnaires which are highly uh, medical in term so some questions like strength and difficulty questions or others Uh, which are there they can be they they use general terminologies and you can find various problems that the child is facing because as dr um Shanti Nambi had very brought about very beautiful in the very beginning that uh, there is comorbidity in disorder behavior disorders and you just cannot ignore it and there are many of them and as Dr. Shekhar Shahadri has told me and I can never forget that it is a heterotopic illness and you will see one part and it will branch out into so many uh, illnesses including anxiety including depression including substance use that you'll have to really look at it so for me it's important that I use something like mini kit which is based upon a diagnostic formulation DSM four to see if some illness is also which is sitting back behind there now it's important that uh, uh, that you understand that the child is not alone and there are a lot of people who can bring information through so uh, i mean it has to be from schools it has to be from parents it has to be from peers and you'll have to as you get to know the child better there will be other sources of information including uh, the you know the probably the justice uh, department somewhere the police somewhere or the well meaning adult who's helping the child out who can give you more information about it so which can you can collate together to make you know sense and hypothesis and lastly the child themselves you'll be surprised if you're going to give them uh, you know uh, objective tests the questionnaires they will be waiting to tell you what is happening with them so that at least somebody can help them make sense out of what they are feeling and uh, yes but it has to be a graded and a collaborative work now uh, coming on to the proper uh, part uh, that is i told that the child doesn't come by himself it is we got two clients now we got the parents and the child and the parent is very important to you because uh, that is the person who has brought the child and that is the person who's going to bring the child again and again that is of course you'll have to work with the child also because you have to be clever enough to show to the child that uh, and genuine enough to give the child that you really are a part of the solution than the problem per se uh the i would not go into the first two parts which uh, uh, dr somya has so beautifully told you about being non judgmental and being having neutral stance but this fine balance is very important if you require to move on anywhere with the child who's defined and probably even hostile uh many a time in your interview sessions this is the parents once given you know a free narrative is going to start off with the blame game and then and so with the child for that matter tell that you know what went wrong and you know this is not the way how it actually is and it will become into a blame session and again because the moment we touch emotions there is going to be a lot of noise out there so you'll have to think of the example that we gave you that is we start from the Uh, for the event we go to the problem and then we go to the emotion so and for this i use a system uh, that has been taught to us something called as abc that is antecedent behavior and a consequence and immediately things fall into perspective this is also a very beautiful way of getting from the event to the problem and then you put in your brain at that point of time and say that though the event appears to be like this there is another way of looking at it and this in the within session itself as if you're thinking on your feet you will be able to change the narration from a blame game to a care where the child is the parent is worried about the child and the and the child is worried about the parent understanding in a different manner and this is the beginning of perspective which is very important because children with disruptive behavior disorder have got a distortion where they look at neutral events in a very aggressive manner and of course the parents have already been hit by it will already have a very a retinue of negative reinforcement traps where they either will not follow through or they will have certain coercive cycles which are increasing in noise and it is extremely good way of 
of joining with both of them using a different perspective and but you have to control the narrative and not let it go out of hand now you'll have to focus on the child and adolescent at all points even if the client is a parent or out here because the main focus of yours is the parent is a is a child and you'll have to help in whatever way that you can be creative be empathetic and uh, be flexible to get the child to understand to be at the child's level to understand the child's problem empathetically but not with identification you don't want to be the child but you require to be the person who understands the child and get him up from a different way of looking at the perspective now uh, when we look at the child per se we also have to look at the young child separately um, in most of the sessions if the child is less than maybe 9 or 10 i usually first see them in a joint session with the the child sits the parent sits and then i let them control the narrative and then i say as the parent can you just move out so that i can talk to the child myself if the child is slightly more you know elder or slightly more independent you better see the child first because otherwise you are already tainted by the perception of the parent is what the child is going to say and you're already on a back foot so you might as well sit with the child first listen to the child's story and understand their perspective then and then move to the parent because that is a milieu which have to work in how much ever you do you have to let the child get back to the milieu who has referred you the child or who which has brought the child to you you'll have to move on as you look for at each sentence that you have to uh, uh, you speak it has to be uh, you know hope has to be there you cannot remove that from from the child your conversations have to uh, look for those skills that the child uh, is going to be having uh, you know somewhere now this is something that doc, i remember from dr shiva shiva shrinath's uh, sessions uh, you know when i'm looking at a child and she used to put a hand like this in front of me and she would tell you know what the child is going to have a lot of problems at school a lot of problems with peers a lot of hits from the family a lot of hits from everywhere and what is going to offset this and here on the left hand she used to say this is what is protects the child and this is what we're looking for it could be an activity it could be a event it could be a, some safe skill it could be some pleasure or joy that the child counterbalances to keep away from the you know the repeated hits of life per se so you'll have to look for those things that is the protective factors at the same time as you're going ahead we'll have to look for the other comorbidities and you'll have to with the child explore one salient event one salient emotion one salient a uh, problem with the child will bring to the table because unless you do not do that you will not be able to process you won't have a what from the child's perspective so that is gives you an entry point or opening point into dealing with the disruption or with the problems or with the deviance or whichever it is so there has to be a context there has to be a consensus and only when this is there will you be able to move on with that particular child now um, as you're moving on we'll have to focus on those things that we can change and we can address and um, this would be again uh, the format of using abc so once we have the problem per se in front of your hand you have to look at the parenting now it's very uh, it's very important that you understand the parenting out here because if you look at the dimension of say uh, you know warmth and discipline and if you look at uh, uh, i mean warmth and no concern Uh, neglect and discipline and no discipline so we have got this this crossroads way out here so at the left side when we have a lot of warmth and lot of discipline so it is good because there will be consistency of parenting the parent will follow through their their uh, you know um, instructions the parent will be there to hold the hand of the child when required and this is parenting is the most impressive and important parenting and it comes from parents uh, personality uh, and temperament also so this is the authoritative if parenting and the the flip side of it the bottom one is that a lot of disciplining but then there is a lot of there's not much of warmth so probably uh, the the child will know how to toe the line but probably will not feel the support that's required so probably the child will stick to the rules but then this is in the case when the child has got normal emotions and capacities to uh, to manage their own emotions if the child doesn't have capacity for that and has got a temperamentally difficult child so then comes the negative part of it that is either the parent is going to give up because you know you cannot after a point engage with the child so there will be no disciplining and there will be a neglect so there will be chaotic style or there will be something like a lot of you know what you call warmth but then there'll be no disciplining and the child will have its way and there'll be uh, you know there will be constant irritation for the parent who will feel helpless in uh, and unable to get the child on the track which he thinks is important 
so this is important of understanding so we have to move from more negative parenting to a positive parenting and that is one of the take home messages now i have spoken about coercive cycles and there are uh, negative and trap uh, reinforcement traps out there and coercive cycles and this is a ripe field for abuse that is the child will get angry for something the parent will show more anger the child will show more anger and then the parent will even show more anger and you know where it is going to go at some point somebody has to back up and that that level will remain there till the anger or abuse increases now the negative reinforcement trap is again the fact that the parenting is influenced by the child's behavior also it is not always that parenting influences the child's behavior but other ways also very very true so you know after a point the parent will just stop following through because it's easier to get away from a situation which is you know so distressing and disturbing and that is a way of negatively reinforcing the defiance and there's a trap from where you'd have to look for it in your abc's and that's why it's important to let the parent bring you the abc that is antecedent the behavior and the consequence of what the parent did so that you can look for these things and because these are things that you can change and address now you will have to also look for exploring the exact scope of problems like someone had asked somia as to how do you ask about sexuality and she said just ask it because that is very important and same way you will have to look at those things that you are not comfortable with asking because you are having an okay time with the child you know and you don't want to upset the balance but you'll have to ask the questions that how far the child is having a problem with legal systems rule violations transgressions etc and because you'll have to deal with those also as the time comes now i uh, the comorbidity is a rule we'll have to rule about it uh, these things concomitantly and we'll have to give a lot of importance to it because usually the child who's having you know oppositional defiance disorder is very difficult to come by positive experiences most of the children have got issue with uh, with adhd or with uh, dyslexia and you know anxiety is not very far behind and depression is not very far behind and because of socializations and they move towards the, the fringes where there's a collection of people with similar experiences so there is already deep vnc happening out there there are gangs happening and as many you know studies have shown that when you are dealing with the adolescent in a gang it is difficult to get them out of uh, you know on the path whereas when the child is alone it's easier to to deal with them so it's important from and there from the gang you'll have other experiences of substance use and other transgressions etc one of the other important stuff out here is also intellectual disability you have you'll be surprised to know that many of the children uh, you know with conduct problems are actually having a uh, you know reduced iq especially the verbal iq to manipulate words to understand what is happening the cognitive part of it doesn't really help the child to look at different perspective and the anger is predominant in them so and i have have got my own subset of children who have who i was able to understand this aspect of it and actually they turn out to be having mild you know intellectual development disorder and thus they are turned out to be disruptive disorders and then once i looked at it the perspectives were changed the parents were able to look at it from different light in fact i was able to successfully bring the parent to understand this and look at the child's proclivity and this child for example had a proclivity for sports he used to love going into the field and to look at other people playing football and cricket so i told the parent why don't you just go up and walk to the person or the manager of the stadium and ask the person to let this child also be a part of the system and lo lo behold in with about a month time when the child came back the parent was profusely thanking saying that now i understand what it is the child is being much better the child is taking up much more responsibility the anger is gone aggression is gone now he is going at a level you know interstate level and i was surprised out of my wits as to what are you talking about and and i saw the changes also so this is how when you understand the comorbidity when you remove that the child has got a much better chance of recovering and being on the path to recovery now um a few i will be now moving through it very fast um because i have got about a couple of slides left now the important part is that when the parents are going to bring the child there are going to be a lot of th thoughts in the back regarding the stigma regarding am i mad am i sad am i having you know uh, there will be also loss of loss event for the parent itself because the parent has lost you know the uh, normal child the child has no lost normal you know childhood and you know etc with expectations there will be a lot of anger as such also so you'll have to accommodate with this parent with this child maybe you'll have to give a different timing with them maybe as somia told you have to go outside with the child and join with them maybe you'll have to give them outside uh, different timings for them but uh, but once you join you see that your therapeutic alliance with but the moment it is done you will see the child starts coming out to you and the parent starts looking at you for more and more and this is the time where you are able to transfer your understanding of the problem to the parent and move on from there 
Now, it's also very important to charter the family dynamics, like who is the boss, who wears the pants, who does what, who is the person who speaks well, who is the person who is punitive most, is the polarization of parenting, and also chart about the various actors within the family. These are the invisible ones who you can't see. The, it'll be the aunties, the uncles, the grandparents, who will have a lot of things to say about how things are being done and probably will continue with their behaviors. So we'll, uh, you know, we'll have to bring them also to the table at some point through some way for a holistic approach or a treatment. Now, the problem is very specific that they brought you, uh, you uh, into the fore to help with the disruptive behaviors, deviancies, uh, the anger, the defiance, the vindictiveness and things like that. So you'll have to make it context specific. You'll have to understand that if the problem happens in the parent, uh, you know, in the, in the, at home and you are trying to get the child more focused at studies, it won't help you much. So it has to be. So if the problem is at home, you'll have to think of what can you change in the home. If the problem is in the school, you have to think of what can you teach? How can you collaborate with the teacher so that you can look at the problem and get in a problem, uh, you know, the problem solved. If the problem with the peer, you have to look at what is operative there so that you can help the child understand a better way of socialization perhaps so that that problem is taken care of first. So it is of course a domino effect, but then it, you have to start with the first trigger of it in a very context specific manner for you to be able to move to the next step. Now, uh, parent management training is one of the uh, cornerstones, uh, as I understand, of the children till about early adolescence and uh, in the disruptive behavior disorders. And uh, these have been taken up from uh, various uh, 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 theories and uh, that of maladaptive interactions and also of social learning. And the important part of it is to understand that there is something uh, beyond just looking. Uh, and learning that is modeling there's also a vicarious modeling that is the child looks at the other siblings other people and how they get their reinforcements and lastly it's very important to have a goal that is the importance of goal setting for finding with the child what you really want because all behaviors that the child is going is going to be uh, dependent upon the reinforcement value and also the expectancy expectancy is uh, what does a child think that this behavior will get him and reinforcement value is, uh, does the child want that or not? So both of these things are very important um, you know, aspects of parent uh, management training. And you have to get this in your brain before you move to the other part. That is, you'll have to take up, uh, you know, um, the understanding. Uh, you have to get the parent to understand that the problem starts, uh, the solution to the problem starts with them understanding and looking at the noise uh, the child behind the noise so the, as i said there will be a development issue happening out there there will be something that the child wants there'll be some requirement of the child which we have not understood and we'll have to address that for uh, the parent uh, has to address that before this noise comes down now in this case it is going to be um, something like uh, quality time with the with the child uh, it will have to be uh, um, you know helping the parent look at the uh, at the uh, child's uh, way of dealing with things. Uh, um, it will have to be as Preeti Jacob, Dr. Preeti Jacob tells me always that it is about catching the child doing good and the parent has to learn it because you at, at the end of the day, what you're trying to do with the child is getting him skills, the pro-social behavior skills, which is going to help the child negotiate the complex merit of interactions with the environment around them. So um, overall, uh, uh, you'll have to start promote uh, the the prop the whole uh, process starts with the child uh, being the center and the parent understanding the child the parent reflecting about what the child is doing the parent looking at from the child's perspective but not losing their own perspective also now yeah, i'm going to just keep this a very busy slide i'm sorry but um, i will be taking going through it also so uh, as i have endlessly repeated that we have to uh, uh, look at um, that what is it that the child wants and we'll discuss as to is there a way of getting what the child wants without this, all this noise that is happening in the environment and is it something that can be given by the environment without increasing the noise and this is a very important part because many a times both the parent and the child the mismatch is between when and not the what so it is the child wants an ice cream it's not uh, it's not that wanting is fine but when is the problem and you know there has to be something that the parent says that you will get what you want but you have to just wait for it so they have to be looking at the reason behind the defiance. 
many times when i look i tell the parents that the if you look at the defiance as more as a strive for independence immediately the eyes big become big and they say oh, okay fine i will try to look at that so it's like the parent is ready to let go but then there are a lot of insert uncertainties and disturbances in the child and the parent themselves and they'll have to understand that that the child will learn but you have to give it time the pace has to be of the child the second part which is really important is also about lies and and the perspective about lies is that i understand is that when you tell the parent that the lies is the truth that the child sees that is you know you fake it till you make it so the, at least when the child is saying a lie the child knows what is acceptable in the society and thus tries to make you know a positive statement towards that you know that by by saying this though it is manipulation yes but the child knows the good and the bad so this is one way of understanding the child knows and probably there is definitely a way of helping the child get what he wants in a more normative manner now it's important the second part that is you have to be kind but firm that is the concept of hand holding whatever be the problem we will get you you know what you want but then you will not be able to ring it out of me but i will be giving it to you at a different time so be be kind be firm no doesn't have to be yelling kind of a no you know can be a simple quiet no and from here comes time out time out is not only from positive reinforcement that is when the child is you know sitting and doing something and suddenly gets defiant and then you are supposed to help the child get away from that particular point to a area which is neutral when the child sits down calms down so it is a time out from reinforcement even a negative reinforcement which you are going to inevitably bring about but it is also important that you as a parent understand that you are boiling over so you have to take your time out so get out of the situation take some time do something to calm your emotions reflect on what is happening in your brain and then come back and address it not only as parent even as therapist when your counter transference is happening and you're really angry or something look use this in the therapy to understand as to why are you thinking that your anger is telling you and you have to use that from that now uh, you'll have to be very clear in uh, uh, telling what you expect out of the child and you have to follow through because not following through and telling things is going to be a negative reinforcement trap which is something that we do not want in this children the, the next last few things is that every interaction is an opportunity to learn so please be on lookout as to what are the teaching moments where you can encourage you know and foster positive behaviors and social behaviors and lastly don't uh, despair it is going to be a long drawn process but then maybe you will take one step at a time so as long as you have what you require uh, you know to to transfer the information you'll have to do it in uh, you know over time it cannot be happening over one or two sessions in one or two sessions probably you're going to manage just about the crisis you're going to be just about looking as to what have i done what can i do and probably looking at the at the family etc and uh, but probably the moment the anger and defiance is little bit reduced the perspectives have reduced probably the parents are also much uh, you know re ready to look at it another way now uh, the last few slides uh, we have to profile skills for the child does better uh, for example if we football it can be cricket and you have to tell the parents that let the child do it for an x number of hours x number of frequency and don't interfere there the problem is not is the fact that parents are going to be wanting their child to excel in that also the issue is not in excellence in any more the issue is in the fact for the child to have a safe haven where the child can do that activity at his pace at his enjoyment and be there for himself and be happy you know when the light blows there's something to balance it out now it's important that you are able to understand the, that uh, we to bring something to the table for example if it is the peer issue so we'll have to teach uh, you know the social skills and from here i borrow the who's uh, life skills uh, and uh, this is a good way to start way to start but i'm going to be focusing more on the child therapy so um, you know we'll have to probably maybe use role playing maybe even uh, um, you know give if the child is bigger enough then maybe situations etc and you know discuss with the child as to what are the various solutions etc but the ultimate end is that you you know focus on all three aspects of problem that is you uh, you have got emotion which is under control that is how do you reduce emotions using a crt principle that is contextual emotional regulation therapy using either sharing or calming or some activity uh, which reduces your you know your energy levels or problem solving per se or and that is you know to emotionally control something to reduce your arousal so once the arousal is is is, re is reduced then you look at at what you can do about your behavior so how can you get yourself you know to the place where you want 
uh, with the pro social behaviors for example how do you join a group how do you hold a conversation how do you participate in the group dynamics how do you say yes and no how do you assert how do you cooperate how do you ask a person politely and these things are going to be helping the child have a sense of you know control agency you know work throughout and other and then just have a tantrum and expecting just that you'll get what you want because that is a short short way of a vicarious of a vicious circle happening and lastly it's about the brain so if you'll have to look at the perspectives that the child is thinking about it is important to think as to when this happened what were you thinking when this happened what were you expecting what did you what were you thinking that is going to happen when these things so this consequential thinking etc uh, perspective taking uh, as um, you know helps the child develop a different skill set which is important in the skill sets as uh, to negotiate the difficult uh, you know of social difficulties and things like that when you have got these three skill sets in place then you can put them into a whole into something like uh, how do you interpret social cues how do you generate pro social options and how do you manage your anger and get back to the problem so this is a whole complex of therapy that you can do with the child over sessions uh, which you can guide yourself and it it, uh, it is uh, can be done in a natural setting also but you have to be mindful of it when you are engaging in the child now uh, i am leaving this for the last that is the pharmacotherapy the role is uh, very limited but it's very important when a child comes to you and what you can see is only anger and you can see disruption and you can see dysregulation and you can see violence and you can see threat of self harm you'll have to address that also so of course there is no guidelines uh, specific guidelines but then you'll have to but for adhd stimulants work for mood uh, for mood disturbances i have seen a child who had come uh when i was at him hands the child had dissociative spells the child had dysregulated uh mood the child was defiant was not able to was get, dropping out of school top it all had abuse experiences that she fell down and she broke her nose and the parent was hit her for that also saying that why did you do fall and why did you hit your nose so it was like you know not only that you fall but your parent is even more punitive about it and all these these things set off a mood episode in the person and not any mood it uh, it was a bipolar so mood stabilizer lithium was used out there with very judiciously and it had excellent results so you'll have to understand the each situation brings a different uh, you know uh, uh, things to the table and you have to accordingly use a judgment and use the correct medicine for that antipsychotics uh, like aripiprazole uh, with the other uh, issues of weight gain etc can be used as seen with dr Prof, uh, professor john himself that had had child was very defined very anger and he prescribed uh, this and i was wondering why and then i understood that is important to reduce the emotional overlay and as the emotional overlay comes down you have got a way to start off with the other things so uh, there of course as uh, dr shobhai used to tell me that if there is a uh, anger the depression is not very far behind um, so you'll have to look at that Uh, SSRIs and also look at that there are depressive equivalents of uh, that is anger in children with ADA with the uh, intellectual development disorder and so uh, which I have also used as a child especially now in the COVID time the child was boxed up inside and was you know had lost a lot of anger uh, pulling and pushing and defined behaviors and you know vindictiveness and things like that and finally understood that there is a lot of things happening which is a change in the way of the child is perceiving the effect also and uh, gave SSRIs and the child became better. and there is also role for coordinating in children with aggression in idd so these are a few tips i am leaving you behind this uh, this is a very vast uh, topic for me and uh, though i would like to carry on but then i guess my time uh, is coming to a kind of a closer so i would like to leave you with a few summary points out here uh, the important uh, part is to understand that uh, disruptive behavior disorders is not just uh, the socialization efforts or interactions becoming uh, going off this is a tip of the iceberg that you're seeing there is a lot behind it there is a lot of temperament issues there is a lot of psychology behind it the brain the things different the perspectives are different there is interactions which you are not able to see which is happening and all of these things together makes into a very entrenched behavior patterns which is the effect program which runs once it set off is difficult to to uh, to curb it so you'll have to in this case look at prevention is better than cure have ideas and ways how to manage a meltdown and if possible don't come to that management includes uh, getting information from very many inputs which includes the school settings the academic settings the peer settings and the house and you'll have to accordingly chart out for the psychometric assessments and at the same time it look at the factors which are protective for the child which you can use in therapy 
you have to look at the comorbidity the child will bring to the table because of the anger being not very far from depression not very far from anxiety and look at the parenting styles that is uh, which is definitely going to be affected in this case because of the child living along with the parent and the parent is going to be cued into the child's behaviors and uh, look at the other modifiable factors that we spoke about now the psychotherapy is the mainstay uh, of the management we have to engage the family per se we have to look for the context to start to begin with we have to uh, focus upon the strengths of the child we have to uh, uh, help both the parent and the child learn uh, you know certain skill sets uh, which they can with which they can negotiate each other uh, or each other's uh, problems or each, each other's issues and uh, pharmacotherapy has a limited but an important role in disruptive behavior disorder and but it has to be judicious so with that i come to an end of a presentation and uh, i think i have speeded up a bit in the, in the end but thank you for a patient listening and it's it's been wonderful to be here thank you dr ragu for your excellent presentation very detailed and vast uh, and uh, done justice to the vast topic that you have uh, taken um, we have a few questions in the chat box which i would like to uh, forward it to you uh, here uh, dr vidya she is asking that since uh, school shut down for the past four months all the family are locked in together for long periods as the parental interaction is not always healthy disruptive behaviors are actually exaggerated kindly comment on it yeah i guess that um, you know this is one of the things that i think we can take from life itself that is you know um, when we come close to something and uh, it's called as familiarity beats contempt or something like that but then this is a very uh, you know uh, odd uh, very uh, general statement now of course when you'll have to understand that it is very true that when children and parents have got themselves to focus on uh, the parents are going to have their will imposed upon the child and the child is going to have his will imposed so it has to be a negotiation so every moment is a teaching moment the parent can try to teach the child how flexible and how adaptable they can be and the child can learn and find positive you know reinforcements from the parent in this manner so definitely uh, this is this is a two way street always a two way street so you'll have to uh, you know let the parent know that uh, you know having giving the child a structure for the day is very important uh, having a way to deal with the child's issues is very important uh, looking at what the child wants is very important finding a way to get what the child wants in a more normative manner without the noise is very important to be able to understand as to you know how or what are the coercive cycles that you get into the traps that you get into is very important and this is of course the you know you are the charity begins at home so the more you are able to understand this and adapt to the child's requirements the child is able to find her or her own center that is as i said the agency and move on from uh, you know becoming a problem uh to you know independence so you know it's a perspective that has to change for everyone so but of course there are genuine issues that are happening so probably you have to look at the mood dysregulation also because children are generally you know affected by the physical constraints so maybe the parent can help you know find more uh, ways how the child can exert physically maybe even you know at the right times go outside play jog sport or something you know in in the covid times you know and help uh, them out so that is my take on it yes uh, one more question when a child is aggressive and breaking things or hitting family members how can the crisis be managed at that time by the family members oh uh, yes uh, this is a extremely important question and something that it require probably a presentation of its own but what's important to understand is that uh when there has to be a very firm line where the child cannot cross because when the child is hitting and breaking there is a destruction of property and self uh, harm is not very far away the emotional regulation is really out of the chart so you'll have to if you'll have to at this point of time if it is the first time you're dealing with it you have to chart down see the antecedents look at what caused the meltdown and you know prepare for it next time uh get yourself out of the harm's way get someone to help the child out of the harm's way get the child to a professional who can help the child out maybe uh, maybe even a responsible adult who can talk the child in finding out what the child wants but important part is that do not say yes no good bad that i listen ask the child i understand that you're angry let me ask you what can i do to let you to uh, to help you out of that mess now if the child is not listening to you at all then probably you'll have to maybe ask the people around you to help you to get the child uh, in a safe manner 
Now, one thing very important I've understood over the year for dealing with children who are very angry and violent is that the child is okay with you helping them out, but the child gets very disturbed if they have got no idea what is happening. So it's very important for you to tell the child what is happening. Half the problem is reduced if the child knows what to expect in the coming few moments. And, you know, sometimes you can verbally de-escalate, but you were just telling that this is what is going to the consequences. And I, we can do these, these, these items. For example, I can take you down from here. We can sit down, we can walk out, we can talk. If not, then I can help you get to a doctor. If not, I can help you give the medicines. If not, I can take you to a place from where, you know, this can be helped, like institution. And usually, a child is able to calm uh, their anger and, you know, come to an understanding as to what the child wants. It's all about not springing a surprise on the child, for God's sake, because that is going to have unexpected um, and unfortunate uh, and, of course, uh, uh, aspects because the child learns from this modeling also. So talk to the child, uh, tell him what to expect and uh, get help. That's what I could say.